Hello. We're going to start it. Um, so welcome, like to the judge night. Uh, we have been doing this for several years. We have the judges for the competition that's going to happen, uh, the TDC competition that's going to happen in, on Saturday. Two of them are going to be here, like to present their work and talk about uh, what they have been doing. Uh, first, like I'm for the upcoming events, uh, we have um, S uh, Brian Collins and someone who works with him, Leland Meishmeyer, uh, called the Gener Gener New Generation uh, on Thursday, February 5th. On February 12th, we have Micah Bink um, uh, coming, you know, talking, uh, the title of the talk is called Important Shapes. Um, on Thursday, February 19th, we have um, the eternal le letter, a book launch and signing with uh, Paul Shaw, Linda Florio, and Scott Martin Kosowski. On February 26th, we have Off the Page, Into the World with Stephen Doyle. Uh, and on March 24th, we have Timothy Goodman with a, um, a lecture that the title seems to be kind of interesting, Getting Away with Shit. So you might uh, be um, very educational. Um, so I'm going to introduce the two um, speakers tonight you know, together so that we don't have like no um, you know, break. Um, so first we're going to have, um, the, uh, we're going to have like, you know, first Paul Barnes from Commercial Type um, and uh, joint venture between Paul Barnes and Christian Schwartz, who have been collaborators since 2004 on various typefaces projects, most notably the award-winning Guardian Egyptian. The company published retail fonts developed by Barnes, uh, by Paul Barnes and, and Christian, Christian, Christian Schwartz, and their staff and outside collaborators, and also represents the two, uh, the two when they work together on type design projects. I'm actually reading this, so like, if it doesn't make any sense, you can raise your hand and tell me that. Like, that. Uh, Thank you, my dear. Okay, say, uh, what did you understand, Matteo? <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> Following the redesign of The Guardian, the team headed by Mar Mark Porter, including Barnes and Schwartz, was awarded the covet coveted black pencil by the DA, DND, DA, DNAD. Uh, the team was also nominated for Design Museum Design of the Year's Prize. In September 2006, Barnes and Schwartz were named two of the 40 more influential designers under 40 in wallpaper and the 10 more sexy person by People magazine. Um, um, Garson Yu. Uh, Garson Yu is a title designer and multimedia artist. Uh, Garson Yu is founder and creative director of Yu and Company. Since 1988, Yu and Company has created over 150 films and television title sequences, earning an Emmy Award and multiple nominations along the way. In 2006, Yu opened Yu Plus Co Lab a division uh, in Hong Kong specializing in new media, interactive, and experimental design. Uh, a native of Hong Kong, Garson holds uh, MFA in graphic design from the Yale School of Arts, having won numerous industri industry awards and critical, critical acclaim. He lectures frequently, frequently at design conferences in universities around the globe and has been featured in various design publications. Garson is a member of the Alliance Graphique Internationale in Switzerland. Uh, and by the way, my name is Robert De Vick. I'm the vice president of uh, TDC. Uh, so, uh, the Paul Barnes is going to like to respond. Few few words. Thanks to the Type Directors Club for inviting me here. Uh, very honoured. Uh, I'm very honoured to be judging uh, one of the judges on Saturday in the Type Design Awards. Um, so I'm going to talk about basically a bit about commercial type, uh, which is the company that I run with Christian, or rather um, I kind of help Christian. Christian is the, the real man be behind it all. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of the projects we've done together very quickly and then some of the projects that I've done with commercial type kind of thing. Um, I mean, I, I kind of feel slightly embarrassed when I get called a type designer because I don't really consider myself a professional type designer. Um, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about Christian because I tend to think that Christian is what I would call a professional type designer. He actually knows what he's doing. He uh, understands the technical processes. 
he can actually make something from the start to the finish, whereas I don't. And kind of Christian comes from a rich line of type designers. So um, he worked at the Font Bureau, and there he learned from people like Tobias, who learned from people like to, uh, David Burlow, from Matthew Carter, and you can kind of trace their heritage back to all those kind of great names in the, the kind of 16th century, the Robert Grandjohns and the Claude Garamonds. I kind of come from a more graphic design, um, typography kind of background, and I'm a bit more of a, you know, my heritage is, is, is kind of a bit more mixed, somewhere between, you know, Jan Schickold and Peter Saville, which is a bit of a strange thing to think about. Anyway, very strange when Christian and, and I were just hearing that we've been working together for, for two, since 2004, so it's a long time. We should have a party to celebrate it. Um, Christian has put up with my, uh, my kind of things. I mean, the first project we, we did together uh, was The Guardian, which is over just coming up for its 10th anniversary. Um, and generally when I talk, we talk about The Guardian, I like to make the joke that I did the meetings, but Christian actually did the work, um, which is kind of true, but I did a little bit of things. And what's interesting about how Christian and I have worked together and also with the other people in commercial type, uh, Burton, who's here, and Miguel and Greg and our various other uh, collaborators is it's quite hard to know where a project necessarily starts and necessarily ends, who does, does what. Um, so kind of Christian and I are kind of a, a songwriting partnership on The, the Guardian. Um, and part of that also, some of the things we did together was also uh, Publico, which was part of The, the Guardian process. And um, more recently, we did a typeface together for Entertainment Weekly um, called Capone, which is a kind of a take on the Doni, um, named after our, our late friend Amid. Um, and it's kind of, this is kind of interesting to think about this one, um, is that very much the Roman was Christian and I was kind of quite a lot of the italic. And uh, Christian seems to think that I'm actually quite good at doing italics and we kind of, I think he, he also says I may be a bit more feminine and things like that. Um, and uh, again, Vanity Fair, Dido, which actually should be Vanity Fair, Mole. It's kind of based on a Mole. Again, it's interesting how Christian and I work together on this with Burton and a lot of it, you know, say I made quite a lot of suggestions and found various examples with our friend Sebastian of, of kind of Dido's through the ages and actually the one I, I said was the one we should follow is the Mole. And uh, I kind of thought that would be my sole contribution and that Burton and, and Christian would let me get on with the, the stuff. But actually, you know, Christian said, you have to do the italic. So th I kind of did quite a lot of the italic, but I didn't really make it into a finished font because things like spacing, kerning, I'm not so good at. Anyway, it, really all the contributions I've made to commercial type would only be possible without my collaborators, um, you know, Christian and Burn and, and Greg and, and Miguel and the various other people. And anyway, that's enough being kind to those guys. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna talk about kind of projects that mainly I kind of started because I find it I find it a bit easier to talk about myself than than talk about how Christians great typefaces um, do. Probably one of the things I'd like to say about commercial type is when Christian and I decided to start the venture. Basically, we realised when we designed the Guardian typeface after a couple of years, we would get the rights back to it, and we had to kind of think what we would do with our our joint child together. And we went through all these kind of strange ideas of let's release it through my fonts or let's release it through font shop. And eventually we kind of came to the idea that we should release it through commercial type um, or we should start this company called commercial type, which was probably one of our sillier ideas. But one of the ideas we had about doing a type foundry was that a bit like a fashion house, we would have typefaces that would be attractive and would get people through the doors and then once they actually realized they couldn't use them, then they would buy something useful. <laughs> so I kind of do the couture wedding dresses. Christian does the typefaces you can actually use. Uh, so, you know, we like to think that every person who goes, oh, they have that great font, Dala Flora, then they come in and buy, you know, 15 weights of graphic or, or 15, but, you know, oh, that's great. So, so this is the first one, Dala Flora, which I'm going to talk about, which is the kind of the stencil font. I mean, you know, as graphic designers, 
we're kind of obsessed by stencils. There's something interesting about them, the kind of mixture between being a, a typeface in the sense of that every zero is the same, but in the application, they have this kind of different feel about them. And, uh, you know, you find them in these kind of um, aspects like on crates, but they're also a kind of way of normal people marking something. So here's the kind of the typical Dido-esque French stencil letter, and it's on a boat, and that's how a non-lettering, non-type person would put on lettering. Um, of course, they have other, you know, you think of things like signs, private, and stuff like that. But of course, and uh, there should be audio now, um, you also think of the military aspect <laughs> of the A-team. And I, I, I'm kind of interested in these things, but I kind of wanted, to, I've always thought of stencils in a more, uh, trying to think of a more elegant kind of stencil. Now, one of the things you probably all read about in that bio of me was that I'm obsessed by gravestones. Um, when I go on holiday, I get an hour away from the family and I go to the local church and have a look and see what the gravestones are like. Gravestones are really, really interesting because it's a record of how lettering was made that isn't like typefaces. So you see a huge amount of variety um, of it. But one of the things I noticed always is if you have a gravestone and it's left out, say, it's in, in the rain, it starts, the thins start to disappear. So you've kind of got this stencil effect, which of course if you take to its kind of logical thing, becomes almost abstract shapes. I mean, you can also find it inside churches where you have a, a, a gravestone just laid flat, people walk over it. And that's always interested me, and I've always thought there's something kind of interesting. And I've always had this kind of long, th I, I thought, why aren't there any kind of Renaissance style stencils? Now, when I started this, this project started back in, in 1997, and which also shows you how slow I am at actually doing anything. Um, the, there wasn't a Renaissance style stencil, so you see this kind of Renaissance letter would eventually become like that. And um, at the time, I was living in America, and I was friends with someone whose mother ran a upmarket ceramics company, and their logo was in Futura, and she said, would you like to change the logo? And I said, yeah, I've got a great idea. I really wanted to take something like, and this is a, a typeface by uh, Claude Garamond, finished by, I think, Le, Le Bé, um, or is it Sabon? Uh, someone correct me here if I'm saying something wrong. All right, you're upset, Matt. This is, this is on video, so of course someone's going to be tweeting later. He got it wrong. <laughs> and I thought, well, this is kind of, you know, what can we do? And so, Nameless Ceramic Company, this was the kind of beginning of what became Dala Floda. So this is back in in 1997, and as I say, I don't really know how to make typefaces. I think this was done in, in Illustrator originally, and then in, in some kind of software called Fontographer. I had no idea, had no idea about spacing, had no idea about any of these things that people like Tobias and Christian know about. And it's a kind of typical, I think, of a graphic designer trying to make letters. Anyway, so I kind of finished the alphabet, and I was really proud, and I went to the presentation, and guess what? They stuck with Futura. But that's the great thing about, I think, making things like type design is that you can keep on, you know, the idea is still there and it can be relevant in another thing. So it kind of stayed in the, in, in the hard drive and gradually over the kind of following years, I kind of made it a bit lighter and, bit, you know, I learned a bit more about making type a little bit more professional looking. And then I kind of thought, oh, I'll add a lowercase. So I kind of looked at the kind of the greats again and... So I added a lowercase. I mean, it's, it's kind of also, as again, back to kind of the kind of graphic designer. You know, if you actually made a stencil, I think, from a Renaissance typeface, you know, on the top, you see how the kind of most obvious one b would be. You just make those kind of junctions. And on the bottom, you kind of see what happens in something like Dalla Floda, where it's, a, it's kind of got an influence of, I guess, modernism, in that the terminals are balls. So there's a kind of a slight abstraction in it as well. And there's also, I guess, to... A, a bit more reduction than you would normally see in stencils. So, you know, on the on the left you see the the kind of original letter, and then you see various abstractions. Some too much in the you know the l uh, capital A, but then in the final one it's quite removing a lot of the thin strokes. Anyway, so this kind of typeface was kind of slowly developing, and around the time Christian and I were doing the Guardian, I was doing some other project which was for the art magazine Freeze. I was the creative consultant, and this is typical for when you do magazine redesigns, they go, I need a new headline typeface. And you say, oh, have you got any money? 
no, I haven't got any money. And then you kind of phone up your friends, you phone up Matthew Carter or whatever, and have you got any unfinished typefaces? And they say, oh, yes or no. And with this one, I kind of casually, at the end of going through hundreds of different typefaces, showed them this typeface, Dala Floda. And they said, wow, that's really good. So they got a free typeface um, out of it, and it seemed to be kind of appropriate. And so kind of at this point also, Christian and I had started to have the idea of what would become commercial type. And Christian is very good at encouraging my stupid ideas. Um, and so Christian said, well, we, we have to kind of make this one of our typefaces. It's a good idea. Why don't you finish it? And I thought, well, that's kind of easy. We just have one typeface. But Christian said, no, 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 it doesn't work like that. You can't just release a single typeface. That will never sell. OK, what do I have to do? You have to do an italic. OK, I'll do an italic. And I think kind of this was the, I think the most fun I've ha ever had drawing a, a, a typeface was this. And I, can't, I think this is a fairly novel, there's not many stencil uh, Renaissance italics out there. Um, and then Christian said to me, that's very good, but you have to draw some more weights. Do I? <laughs> and it's kind of interesting. At commercial type, we have this kind of thing. We kind of make this joke. We like to push things to the maximum. We like to go beyond. We're kind of slightly perverse. So if you look at something like graphic, eventually when it gets finished, there's going to be seven widths, ten weights. So that's 70 typefaces with the italics. So that's 140 typefaces. That's pretty completist. So in something like this, Christian said, well, you've got to go to 11 kind of speed. You've got to make a super fat version. And it was kind of interesting drawing this because if you look at a lot of serif typefaces, old style serif typefaces, it's only really in the 60s and 70s that you actually start to see really bold versions of them for advertising. But they're actually quite wide. And in a sense, Dala Foda, the fattest weights are, are kind of closer to a fat face. If you look at the kind of in, inner counters and the serifs on the top ones, they're quite wide. But with Dala Floda, like uh, Isambard, which is a, a fat face that Christian and I are working on um, eventually to be released, again, it's the fattest fat face we've ever found. So again, it goes up to 11. So Dala Floda has that. So Dala Floda doesn't get super wide as well. So anyway, this is the kind of thing that we've done. We've made all these weights going up to a kind of super fat, which again, I think those of, those of you who make typefaces, this is kind of really fun because you've got to make, it, it's quite creative trying to fit all this weight into quite tight spaces and make it convincing. And again, in a typical kind of commercial type, it's got to have all the trimmings in. So this was just like we kept on adding and adding. So we added small caps and we added all these kind of extra letters like, you know, Cues, three different tail lengths, ampersands, different ones, old style figures, lining figures, small capital figures, fractions. I've never seen them used ever. And then all these things actually are quite useful. So a CT ligature is great if you want your company happens to have CT in the middle of it. You've got a logo there. This is a great logo font for anyone who wants to buy a typeface. Okay. <laughs> Sales. And of course, with the italic, you can't have a Renaissance italic without your sexy swashes. And you notice I put that word extra in to have that EX. <laughs> nice touch. And going up to the fat weights as well. So it really was a lot of things. I, I didn't bother counting the number of glyphs, but there's far too many glyphs. But, you know, it's part of our thing, because otherwise we do get that email from somebody in somewhere who goes, why haven't you done the M terminal in that way? Oh. So it's kind of a mixture between, you know, being a kind of something from the Renaissance, but having that kind of totality that we now expect in, in typefaces in all these different ways. And, you know, this typeface started out as a logo. So when we started commercial type, we thought, well, we've got to have a logo in our typeface. We thought, oh, I can't do it in Guardian, can't do it in gra graphics. So it's become the kind of commercial type logo as well. And now when we've done web fonts, We've kind of made a web font version of it that shows how um, mad we are. But actually, quite a few websites have used it. Um, at the beginning, I talked a bit about how what happens when the erosion continues. And you know, the erosion eventually turns into a, a kind of sans serif. 
And this was the next thing I discovered about making typefaces, is that you can't just release one and then forget about it. You actually have to do some more work. So I kind of thought I could just retire at this moment. So Christian suggested that I do some more typefaces. And so it kind of seemed a logical, it's a fairly logical thing. Commercial type, if a typeface has serifs, we knock them off. If a typeface has sans serif, we add them. It's a fairly straight thing to do. So there's a version of Dala Floda where, yeah, we've knocked off the serifs, Dala Moa. The only real thing in this is the kind of process is, of course, an italic, a Renaissance italic. When you knock off the in and out strokes, it looks a bit strange. The spacing all goes, and it looks a bit peculiar, all the angles. So even when you start to improve the spacing, it still looks a bit strange. Um, and this is a typical thing, an homage to one of our heroes. I've always loved this typeface. Um, I'm surprised someone hasn't digitized it. It's Saskia by uh, Jan Chikold, um, released in 1931. I've always kind of liked this very upright thing. So the italic for Dalamoa is upright. I mean, also with Dalamoa, um, you can make very light weights in a serif, in a sans serif. I don't think you can, the lighter weights of Dala Floda there are really unconvincing. So there's, there's some extra weights in there as well. Nice Goethe quote. And it's got all the swashes as well, but they're a little bit more subdued. So this was Dala Floda, Dala Moa. And at the back of my mind, Christian and I had this idea of what happens if we turned it into a line typeface. We've always loved this typeface prisma um, done by Rudolf Koch. Um, it's a version of Kabul. It's just kind of super cool and super clever. And we kind of thought, well, we'll, we'll do a version maybe of graphic or, or, or um, platform. Several other people have done this kind of thing. So we thought we'll, we'll do one of, of Dala Floda. And of course, there's also there's, there's something like Cristal, which is a, an inline font done by Charles Peño uh, just after the Second World War, I think. Um, so we thought we'll, we'll do this. And actually, it was a really good idea, which, which is fairly simple. Um, you simply add lines to Dala Floda. Um, you make some changes in that you can't have balls and you have to open up. Unfortunately, when I came up with the idea, or Christian, I came up with the idea, we were waiting for the technology, um, and our good friend Frederick then made the technology to do it relatively easy, or relatively easy, i.e. it was half as much of a lot of work, so it was still quite a lot of work. And then Ben Keel, um, very talented type designer, was mad enough to agree to do it. I don't quite know why he was that mad, but... And as you see, as you get in bolder weights, you get more stripes. So it's kind of got, what's interesting about this is it's kind of got this optical effect. Again, <laughs> we've got to have all those things like the fractions. So I thought putting fractions in Dala Floda was stupid. Putting them in this is really, so, you know, and it's got all those things. And in the italic as well. And... Um, one of the things about commercial type is we like to do really silly ways of promoting our typefaces. They're mainly silly because mainly people don't actually see them, and so they don't know we're actually promoting them. But some of you may have been around New York recently. Christian had this great idea that we should do posters for Dala Prisma. So these posters were around uh, Manhattan and uh, Brooklyn. I don't know if anyone actually realized when they saw the poster what it was promoting. Um, they probably just saw the quote and just thought, what the hell does this mean? Is this some kind of new band? Um, and we posted them up in, in London as well. And equally, I don't think anyone knew what the hell we were doing. But, you know, we like to do these kind of slightly strange ideas that actually probably get more... Um, s people see them more when we give talks uh, than actually see them in, in the real world. So, so kind of dial a flow, if you imagine that was a really... It, it's a lot, it was a lot of work making all those things, and... Um, I thought it was an interesting idea. It was a kind of take on history. And somewhere at the back of my mind, I'd had another idea on history. This was before I met Christian again. And Christian and Burton encouraged me to finish it. It's probably the world's... Um, it's definitely the world's thinnest 
typeface. It's probably also one of the world's silliest typefaces. Um, it's called Marianne, and it's a series of um, hairline typefaces. This started off on the 12th of February, some year when two days before Valentine's Day, I thought I'd better do a Valentine's Day card for my wife. That's one of the problems about being a graphic designer or anything. People expect you to do something very creative. Um, and I kind of always have loved copper plate. And, but the problem with copper plate is it's got a lot of associations with certain kind of slightly stiff social stationery. And so I kind of wanted to reinvent that. And I thought, well, what happens if you just turn it into a thin monoline? Because in thin monolines, you can do really interesting things. In Illustrator, so you can add a second layer and you can merge them together. And you can put a bit of white on there. Oh, it's a bit of pop art. And it kind of like, I thought suddenly you've reduced it down to kind of something like this, which is, you know, from Stockholm, neon lettering. So I had this idea, maybe there's something interesting to make a series of typefaces that are a typeface that's very, very thin. Of course, thin letters are nothing new. Um, some of you may know this. This is the Gorton Code, which is one of the first examples of a sans serif letter cut in the 5th century BC, I believe in Greece, which is basically a huge series of walls where laws are written down. But of course, you know, if you're cutting in stone, the easiest thing is literally just to make this line. But if you look around and you spend enough time in churches, as I do, you can find very, very thin letters. This is cut in marble, and if you imagine cutting a letter into marble, you don't make a deep V cut, you make quite a small line and then someone's filled it in. So here's Marianne, uh, 18th century style. And in the 19th century, you can find examples. This is an example from uh, Stevenson Blake, around 1837. This is about six points. So those of you who know about punch cutting will be amazed by the cu how actually cutting that. Um, and then you're probably more amazed that someone would print something like that. They didn't really become popular, mainly because I think printers hated them. And of course, those of you who are of a certain age will also remember hand rendering where if you render with a rotary pen, serif letters become monolines. So I kind of had this idea, maybe I could go back and go back to the Renaissance again and make a new version of, say, a Garamond or a Grand Jean, one of the classics, and see how much you could reduce it down. So if you take a kind of Renaissance letter at the top and you kind of, ah, the first thing you do is you remove the serifs. That doesn't actually... That's kind of a form of reduction, but I kind of think, you know, and even when it's taken down to its very thinnest, it's lost something by actually removing the serifs. Um, you must keep the serifs. And now you're going to say, why make something so thin and monoline? And at that thinness, I think it's the only place that you can actually do a monoline letter. I mean, if you look at the top, those are monoline letters. And as they get heavier, um, they get just fatter and uglier. If you look on below it, it's future, and you see how optically it's been corrected. And I wanted to make it very thin so that you could do those kind of things in Illustrator. Um, but also I thought, well, that's really good. You can reduce it down. It's the thinnest it can be, but it still has the bare bones of what it is. So here's an, a Grand John Italic from um, around 1554. And quite simply, that's what I did. And it's really, really hard to do. And so I kind of thought, that's all it needs to be. So, you know, commercial type, let's add all those extras, swashes. This also makes your eyes go slightly strange. And then Christian said, well, you've got to do a Roman. Okay, I've got to do a Roman, okay. So there's a Garamond, so we had to add all the kind of things that you'd add into a Garamond. So you've got some swash letters there, that's very nice. You've got to have small caps because people are going to really use them, aren't they? And we kind of had this vision that actually, as I say, we've been talking about copper plate and social stationery, that, that this would be the new typeface for social stationery. So the royal family, they would set it in Marianne. Of course, they didn't do it. <laughs> Around this time, when I was thinking about just the Roman and Italic, I was on a summer holiday, I was thinking about how maybe this kind of slightly weird typeface could be conceptually expanded. Um, this is terrible when type designers and graphic designers start to think they're artists and come up with concepts. And so I kind of was reminded of, of these two albums from the 1960s and 70s um, where Walter and later Wendy 
Carlos had rendered the classical things like Bach on a Moog synthesizer. And I thought, well, maybe I can make a kind of classical album where I render all the typefaces in a certain way. And recently I saw this, this quote by uh, Jeremy Della. There is an alchemy, really, to cover versions. When you have a really good cover version of something, it changes the way you can look at the world. Good cover versions show how the world has changed and the potential for change. And I thought, oh, that's, that's really interesting because this is what I wanted to do. I decided that I would make all the serif typefaces and uh, all the greatest hits into the same way. So we did a bit more Grandjean and Garamond. I know you sound like they all look the same. A bit more Grandjean. Dutch typefaces, uh, Kiss. Baroque, Fleischmann, Rococo, Fournier, Baskerville, Transitional, Modern, Bodoni, and then at the end, Richard Austin. We kind of stopped at 1812 because that's kind of the period when book typefaces, the book serif typefaces, is no longer the dominant form of communication, and you get the explosion in display faces. Um, we did try making a fat face, but it doesn't kind of work. And we did think of making an ironic version of Times New Roman, but we know that our friends at Monotype would probably sue us. So that's a great album. And, you know, do you remember vinyl? Did anyone here remember vinyl? You kind of got that, mo yeah, this one. You got that moment where the record's still playing. And then you have the bonus track. Christian and I love perversity. How perverse can you get but this bonus track, Black Letter. Henrik van den Keer, the younger letter cutter, wishes his divine furtherance and late and favouring all things saw with love as a good type. So we did a Black Letter as well because we kind of thought it'd be kind of cool on T-shirts, you know, and things like that. Um, so I kind of did all the drawing and then Christian said to me, yeah, we can't release this, you know. We're going to have to make this actually work. So Christian and Burton then disappeared for four months and seemed to spend, Christian's now telling me eight. But you can imagine, just think in your mind how much Christian's hourly rate is worth, how much this must have cost. That's 19 fonts, 250 years of history. That's over 10,000 individual glyphs and between us all, 10 years of work. That's a hell of a lot of work. I know you guys are feeling sorry for us, go and buy the font, yep. The problem is it's really, 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 really fine, and so it's really, really hard to use. So, of course, we spent all this time and all this money, and then Christian has a very good friend, Dino, who said, why don't we do a pop-up show? And I was like, well, wh what do you mean? Let's do a pop-up show. Let's spend even more money and time. <laughs> so downtown, we found a space, and we did it, and so we put the love sign up, and we turned that into neon and had various things course a lot of tourists came past there saw the love sign and thought it was an upmarket sex shop they were somewhat disappointed when they went in and they just found kind of neon letters and we called it the thieves like us show because i think type designers are if we're honest we, we borrow and steal quite a lot of our ideas but also because christian and i are kind of obsessed by 80s pop music and the music of new order so we did all these ways, Dino and Christian uh, did all these ways of rendering Marianne. So they did some nails, or they did some nails, and then when they put all the nails in, they realised that the, the paint had been damaged. So they pulled all the nails out and then put all the nails, repainted and then put all the nails back in again. These kind of mirror boxes and the rendering of the names and the typefaces. So it's a really good, good idea. So yeah. We spent even more time on this typeface that's not going to sell that many copies. And then we thought when we had a, an intern, Sandra, from Switzerland, we'll make Sandra do a text version of it. So now there's, there's a text version and web fonts as well, web versions of it. And then when Miguel came to work from us, um, we got him to do the rest of it, which was really nice. So he did Marianne 1757 and Marianne 1800 and because we know that someone wants it somewhere in the world, we did the black letter. I still think, you know, if you want to put on a T-shirt, it's really good. Um, 
you kind of realize that I'm kind of interested in history. And, th and the next project, Christian and I were talking yesterday about, about how, um, how we felt when some of our competitors got jobs. And, and we were like, we, we, we really don't mind. But some, occasionally there's a job where you just think, I, I really, really want that job. And the next job is a job that I did for um, something called the National Trust. And I'm kind of obsessed by British lettering, British vernacular lettering, where where it all comes from and what it means. And um, I, you probably, none of you know what the National Trust is, or some of you will have a vague idea. The National Trust is an organisation that was set up in the 19th century to preserve. It's the National Trust of England and Wales and Northern Ireland. There's a separate one in Scotland. Um, it was set up to preserve what seemed to be a, a fastly disappearing countryside and, and heritage. And they're an organisation of over 3 million members, um, 60,000 volunteers and 10,000 employees. And I think after the Crown, i.e. the Queen, they are the biggest landowner in Britain. And they have a really diverse property portfolio, so to speak. So they have things like World Heritage Sites, the Giant's Causeway, Bronze Age, um, White Horses and Chalk, Rothschild's French um, Country House, uh, Wollaston Manor. Things like Levant Pumping House, British Industrial Heritage. This is a World Heritage Site as well in Cornwall. Through to the house where John Lennon grew up. And um, Wolf Holland had approached the National Trust to have a kind of rebrand and the National Trust, uh, Wolf Holland's decided that I was the right person to do this project with. So the first thing you look at them, they use these three typefaces, Albertus, Helvetica, and Bembo. Well, let's have a look at the heritage of those typefaces. One of them, we might just about say, has a little bit of Englishness. Bertolt Volpe did come over and do it for monotype, but he was pretty German. Helvetica, you cannot make out that's British. Bembo, you still can't make out it's British. One of the other reasons for having a corporate typeface, again, is, is actually, as you will see, um, it costs a lot of money to, to, to license a typeface. So they obviously wanted one that would be easier for them to distribute. I mean, one of the first things you do with this is they said, whatever we do, we're not getting rid of the leaf. We can't get rid of the leaf. You kind of start something like this by saying, well, what works with the leaf? What says Englishness or Britishness? So obviously you've got Caslon. That's a bit old-fashioned. We need to make ourselves more modern and friendly. Okay, so our transitional, uh, oh yeah, okay, or a, a modern, yeah, you know. And of course, uh, this is what I said to them. Why don't you use Gil Sands? You know, one of the things that commercial type believe in, if someone else has a typeface that can do the job better than anything we can do, there's no need to use us. You know, save everyone time, save everyone. Obviously, licensing Gil Sands would have been problematic on a financial point of view. Um, I can see that members of the monotype team are now getting annoyed at the loss there of licensing money. They won't be talking to me. But they did say they wanted a sand serif, and Wolf Ollins had gone and bought a copy of the um, Nymph and the Grot, the famous essay on the, the history of sand serifs. And if you look around, Britain has a really rich heritage in sand serifs going back much earlier than most people would presume. This is a building from the 16th century, which to all intents and purposes is a sans serif. Now, of course, the nymph and the grot is named after this famous inscription. This is a photograph taken by James Mosley um, of this inscription, which is at a place called Stourhead. Um, it was lucky that James took a picture, I think around 1965, because just after this, um, the National Trust employed a builder to come and renovate this place where it was and he looked at this inscription said oh it's got a crack in and he took it out and replaced it and uh, who knows what happened to it they actually had to make another copy after the builders failed to understand the nuances of lettering so Wolf Allen said well this should be the the typeface and I said well if you look at it, it it's a little bit strange isn't it that's not really a corporate typeface and it doesn't really look like a logo so, okay, and so they read the next chapter of The Nymph and the Grot. <laughs> and they found this. It's the first sans serif typeface. Um, I know I've got the world's leading expert on sans serif typefaces in the room. This has a date around 1817. 
but 18, 16, 18, it could be either way. It also is the world's first geometric sans serif, um, I'd like to point out, a, long, a lot earlier than Futura. If you look at that O, it's a perfect circle. Uh, you look at that S, it's that. So, of course, though, if you set the National Trust in it in all caps, it doesn't have the kind of friendliness they wanted to do. So, like it all, all things, put it in lowercase. And corporate design co uh, thing, let's get rid of the word the. Obviously, that's, that's where you collect your big fee. <laughs> anyway, I won't be working for Wolf Farms again. Um, so, yeah, yeah, we liked it. We developed it, looked at it. Yeah, this is going, going somewhere. It's good. And, 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 and you know, it, was, it seemed to work very well. And then the National Trust kind of said, wow, but it's a little bit too... Maybe it's not pretty enough. Maybe it's not. It's too urban and all those kind of things. So I said, okay, well, what else can we do? So let's do a serif. And so I suggested to them, Brunel, because I just wanted to get this typeface finished. This is a typeface that was started uh, in about 1995. So it's nearly 20 years, and we still haven't managed to finish it. And they looked at it, and they kind of said, ah, but, you know, the thing about Brunel is you kind of think of urban and industrial. And one of the things about the National Trust is... It's most of its members come from this kind of place, but actually they, they want to go and see properties that are in the country. They want the rural and pastoral, and that's Stourhead, um, which is a, actually a completely fake landscape. It was designed by the landscape architect, um, Capability Brown, so that lake doesn't exist. But that's the kind of thing that people join the National Trust to go and have away days in this kind of places. And when I think of this, I kind of think of like lettering, and, of course, here's something by the great type designer, John Baskerville. This is actually a, a little slate about that size, but we might as well call it his business card. He had it in his shop window, and people would come by, and he cut letters for them. I mean, if you look at the, the lettering in the, in the second line, um, that does look a lot like Baskerville's typefaces. So I, I would th I, this is brilliant territory for me because, as you know, I like hanging out in graveyards. Um, and you can go all over Britain, and you can find absolutely splendid examples of lettering. There's no other country, I think, that has such a rich and dense kind of amount of this kind of lettering. So this is in Derbyshire. This is in, in Cornwall. And this is one of my favourite ones. And it's, it's kind of like type, but it isn't like type. Um, you know, it's got a kind of freedom, a kind of beauty, and a kind of, uh, you know, just wonderful. I mean, you can also find it in these, these manuals, like this is a writing manual by Bowles around 1788, and it has a different feel to type. It feels less stiff. And I love this because it has a, a title page for painters, engravers, carvers, gravestone cutters, masons, plumbers, and other artificers, and very useful for merchants and tradesmen's clerks. And it should have a subtitle on designers in the 21st century bereft of ideas. Anyway, so, so this, this kind of typeface that, that we kind of suggested for the National Trust, if you look at the top, there's, there's Brunel. It's got a stiffness of, of a typeface. And then you've got below it a typeface, but a typeface based on lettering, uh, Chiswick. I mean, obviously, you know, you look at the lowercase letter Y, um, it's got a long tail that you could just couldn't get away with in a typeface in metal. But, of course, now you can. And you look at that G, it's kind of got this kind of exuberance to it. Something like the italic, it's got a great, much greater slope, closer towards something like a copper plate script. It's got those kind of hooked tails at the top of the, the letter L and D. And um, it's, also a type, it's also a typeface where nothing is the same. So you normally type designers, the N and the H, they're kind of the same, but this everything's slightly different in weight. And in a sense, with Brunel, one of the problems about doing Brunel is we try to make it absolutely perfect, but with this, it's kind of a little bit kind of freer. All right, the National Trust looked at it, everyone liked it, and uh, it was going along swimmingly. It went past the, the accessibility officer who decides if it's legible, so we made a version down for kind of all the manuals they have to do, so down to tech sizes. And then someone said, um, it's a little bit too pretty. And if you remember, they said, oh, okay, that's fine, okay. Because the great thing about typefaces is they, they kind of can be used in different places. 
And um, around this time, our friends, uh, Grace and Robert, who'd, who'd been using Brunel at Condé Nast Portfolio, had gone to work at a new magazine. Um, and they said, oh, have you got any kind of, kind of typefaces like Brunel that are a little bit prettier? And Christian said, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I've got one just for you. you. You should have a look at this one. It's really good. And Christian goes, oh, but who's it for? I said, oh, we can't tell you until she's approved it. She, she, who's this? And we kind of, this is one of the interesting journeys, and it's one of the interesting is like a type, something that has come from over here, England, 18th, 19th century, something you might find in gravestones and shop fronts, things like that, ends up in a magazine in America for Oprah Winfrey. It's a bit of a funny, funny journey, I think. But of course, if you look inside and you look at the kind of pages, actually that kind of italic, that quite pretty, almost copy plate italic works. And it can work on serious stories as well. So obviously they meant this, this meant we had to kind of develop it. But again, commercial type perversity, it's a typeface based on lettering. So you've got to have lots and lots and lots of swashes. Lots and lots of different terminals. And as it's based on, on, on gravestones, you've got to have lots of different numeral styles as well. So, you know, you could have something like this where you've got all these different multiples. So anyway, but, but of course the National Trust was still calling. So we've gone from a sand serif, that didn't quite work, and we went to a, a, a serif, and that was too pretty. So what do we do? Maybe we need to find something and go in between, so a kind of sand serif with high contrast. Now this is, again, you spend time in grave, grave st graveyards, this is the kind of thing you find. This is probably, uh, it hasn't got a date, so I can't say, but it is a high contrast, or a higher contrast sand serif. And if you look, you can find them fairly typically all over the place. This is one from 1796. This is one from the Figgins foundry around 1845. And if you take away the drop shadow, it's a high contrast or a higher contrast sans serif. Um, so much earlier than where people normally kind of associate these things in type founding. So I said, well, let's try and make something from a kind of typical transitional. So the kind of something as beautiful as this. And uh, there you can kind of see what, what happens. So you put it next to the, passes the test. So it has this kind of nice mix. I know you're thinking they're going to reject it at some point. This story has a happy ending. You can see I got quite far. We did wait. And we put it on the front. And it worked. And they actually said, yes, this is it. And, I, uh, you know, it's nice to have done a job for a very, very uh, worthy client and one where you think actually you've done something that you're very happy with. And they do. They use it all kinds of places. And things like signage. And I love this particular example is someone actually doing a hand-lettered version of a typeface, which is very nice. Now, Chiswick kind of has developed further, and this is, uh, I, I'm, I'm talking about Chiswick because also it's one of the typefaces that we'll be releasing this year, so I'm giving you a kind of a, an advanced promotion of it. So you would have liked to think that in, in, in Sensible Things we would have stopped there, but when we were doing it for the National Trust, we kind of developed a few other ideas, mad ideas, and one of them was that this kind of thing, which inspired us, if you can kind of see it's quite hard to see the second line down, it's 1831, this is the first example I can find of a really high contrast sans serif. It's basically, to me, it's a serif letter where they just haven't added the serifs. Um, and I've just always found it really, really beautiful. Um, and so, you know, taking something like Chiswick and, and doing that commercial type thing, let's knock off the serifs. And so it kind of has this kind of feel to it. So. And again, we have to do lots of weights there. I mean, I think something like this is what's interesting about it is also develop it, something that comes from history, but not so true to history that you kind of can't do something like a very, very lightweight, which has a very different feel to the heavier weights. And then the metallic, which has a kind of feel of almost like a kind of modern sans serif copper plate. And like many things, its journey is somewhere, again, well, again somewhere slightly strange. We share an office with a very cool magazine called Document, and they, were, they often come past our desks and look at what we do, and they go, oh, that's cool. And so they, they, they've adopted it. And uh, Christian, being the genius he is, kind of conjured up a kind of text 
version of it. So there's that, the high contrast version. Of course, the other thing is, if looking at all this vernacular lettering, this is um, some examples from the, the late 19th century, you know, the kind of sans serif, um, low contrast version. And I've kind of, making typefaces like Dial Off Loader and, and Marianne, which are very highly polished, I've kind of wanted to do a typeface that is really unpolished and quite rough. And so I've always liked these kind of letters and I wanted to do something that kind of reflected this kind of sans serif that wasn't a typeface kind of feel to it. I mean, again, you find it on things like locomotive letter um, name place. This is one from York. Um, it's almost like kind of within the letter O, it's almost a geometric shape. And then a quite a strange uh, italic as well. I've also always liked this particular kind of typeface. This is a typeface by Figgins, um, I think in the 1830s, which I've always really loved. It's kind of crudity again. It's got a very round O. And I'm very lucky to have um, do quite a lot of stuff with St. Bride's Printing Library. And there they actually have the matrices for some of those large Figgins typefaces, which are quite amazing. I show it because if you look at the O there, it is perfectly round. So it's kind of got this slightly kooky, avant-garde kind of feel to it. So again, lots and lots and lots of different weights. Um, those who like cycling will realize I'm a cycling fan. And again, one of our friends, um, Richard, has used it in this kind of avant-garde magazine, which again is a kind of peculiar journey that you've got this kind of typeface inspired by 18th, 19th century English lettering ends up being in a cool kind of magazine. So, um, God, it's 45 minutes. I'm nearly on, on the, the money for the time. This is our, our next typeface that hopefully will be coming out. I say coming soon. I haven't given a date, but it is coming out this year. Isn't it, Christian? It is. So get your pre-orders in now. So anyway, I'd like to thank you all for, for, for coming um, and hearing me and, and being such a good audience. And uh, I'd like to say any questions. I, I don't know if questions are all going to be at the end. At the end. All right, well, I can go just go and put Commercial Types logo up there or in Prisma and say uh, buy our farms. Anyway, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm sorry for being so long. Oh, we're just going to quickly switch over. And now for something much more interesting. Thank you, Paul. Okay, all right. So I hope this work. Um, well, I'm so honored to be here, and I uh, have not been back for a long time. I um, I used to spend a lot of times, you know, in in New York when I graduated from, you know, from you know from the school that I went to. I um, I went to a very traditional graphic design school and I have a privilege to study with um, you know, Paul Rand and Barbara Thompson. You know, I have a very traditional um, um, you know, graphic design training and I always fascinated by um, you know, typography and, you know, and, and whatnot. But the, you know, my, my career has you know, has evolved and changing and all this, and and I, I was I am so honored to ask to present, you know, my work that I been you know you know doing for the past um, twenty years. Um, so I want to talk about me. <laughs> this is me. The reason why that I want to talk about me is because I think that, and I wanted to tie 
you know, um, you know, tie in the idea of emotion because I think that um, emotion has to is is something that is very personal, and I always, you know, when I was you know at school and was a print graphic designers and I always tried to figure out a way to, you know, communicate um, emotion through a static image and, you know, communicate emotions, you know, through typography and things like that. But I think that emotion is a very personal thing. This this is a picture was taken, you know, in 1971, you know, in Hong Kong, and um, is, you know, is myself when I was young. This is a picture you know, that recently I took and, and it's an object that I find when I, you know, when I study my undergraduate um, degree um, in graphic design in, you know, in, in the 80s. And um, I find this rock, this stone, that a kind of, to me, is an object that, you know, um, I personally attached to it. And I was walking on, um, on the beach with uh, my friend John Robson. And, you know, you know in the 80s, it's always been, there's a lot of, uh, lots of, you know, marijuana and all this, you know, <laughs> which is not supposed to, I'm not talking about. But this, this, this you know, yeah, I guess, you know, this is something that I find. And I saw a face, you know, in this stone that, you know, connected to me. And then I kept it for a long time. And, and this is another object that I, you know, I, I made, I created, you know, this, I created this object, um, you know, in, you know, in the 80s, and my friend, you know, he, he just had a twin. And, you know, and I decided to make two bottles, baby bottles, in, with uh, two nipples, identical with both nipples. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, what you see inside, what contained inside is my son, um, you know, uh, an umbilical cord and a little pearl, you know, get trapped in, you know, in it. Um, the reason why that I want to show those images is because object itself always carry stories. And, and I'm more interested in, you know, the story, what the story behind, you know, each object. And this is another object that I, I, I made, you know, um, in, in the 80s that, you know, is a cane that I thought, well, you know, maybe more, you know, perhaps that would be more functional if I put a wheel you know, at the end of the canes, you know, maybe it will, you know, will help people to walk. But I, I guess it, it didn't work out that way. But more, you know, more I think about, more I doing all this, objects that you know has meaning to it and each objects that I created and, and there are there were intention and there were purpose that I, I created those objects. And this is a brush that you know that I find you know in a uh, um in a uh, in a in in an antique store and I, I braided it and I thought that you know that make it more pretty and you know can I actually use this, you know. Um and this is another object that I find in Amsterdam, you know, a few years ago, and I went to a, um, you know, a conference there, and uh, at the, you know, at a, um, at an antique store, this is actually the, 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 the salesman, the, the, the guy at the antique store told me that, you know, this is from Africa, and I was wondering, you know, how does this little object get, you know, from Africa, you know, to Amsterdam? So meaning that you know every object itself that has its own meaning, you know, has its own story to it, and they all represent you know the somehow that reflects the the interest and the personality of you know of the owner who owned those objects. Um, so this is a donut. Um, you know, in, in, in Los Angeles, you know, we don't have donuts that popular, but I guess, you know, I, 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 I spent my two years in Massachusetts, Dunkin' Donuts. Dunkin' Donuts is really popular. And so um, the reason why that I bring all this, you know, you know, objects, you know, ideas and story of this 
you know, a lot of time that, you know, when I, you know, when we, I would say, to, you know, myself and my team, um, you know, at UN Company, um, when we create um, title sequence, a lot of time that we not only would, you know, use typography, um, you know, as part of the elements, you know, or the, the, the main, you know, um, in, um, elements, you know, in our title sequence. We are a lot of time that, you know, we will, in order to set up the, um, the, uh, the, char the characters, you know, of, um, you know, of the, of, the sh of, the, of the actors and the actress, we will use um, objects and subject matters that related to the subject matters, uh, related to, you know, the, the character, we, or reflects the character itself. So I want to show you um, um, a piece that you know, um, you know, we finished, you know, and I was working with uh, designers, you know, at UCode, um, um, Cinderella Pan. We've been working together for many, many years. Um, so we created this title sequence is, you know, uh, is using objects, you know, to set up the tone. Um, you know, for the TV show called, um, you know, um, Olive Kitteridge. So it's a HBO show. So as you see, the, this title sequence is very, very, very deep and everything is unfolding very slowly. And each object, it kind of reflects, you know, the, the main character, Francis um, 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 Madonna and, and then two others, you know, uh, male characters. Um, so, um, the the other um, you know title sequence that I wanted to um, you know talk about and you know also is something related to um, you know a, a, a Renaissance fresco painting that um, that that I you know I used that idea to, you know for um, a, uh, a HBO show called um, um, Leftovers. The leftovers is about a rapture happened, you know, in you know, in our world. Um, it took two percent of the populations, you know, globally, and you know, a show about you know how, you know, the families, you know, kind of, um, you know, kind of heal itself, you know, heal themselves in you know in in dealing with you know crisis, you know, and and, and family issues, you know, like that. Um, s the, 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 the reason why that I, I, I use um, the idea of um, Renaissance um, fresco painting is, you know, in the old days, um, you know, you know the artists use, you know, they illustrate, you know, everyday life, you know, the biblical stories, you know, on war 
and that's how they communicate, you know, to um, to other people, well, because it's not the majority of the people they they are very they know how to read is all you know all the um, you know, um, pe you know people you know in the, in the church you know they they are more educated. Um, so you know I work with um, you know this artist you know in um, in Massachusetts. Um, his name is um, John Foster. He created a series of um, and many vignettes of um, you know of uh, illustrations, um, you know, to deal with the the issues of you know domestic violence and you know and 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 you know and whatnot and all this. So um, the 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 reason why that you know I I wanted to show this you know um, um, this this piece is 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 the personal kind of um, emotional connection that you know I have hope you know to connect to you know to to the viewer it's it's something that I think that is you know not only just a visual um, excitement or layout that you know we normally would see but it's the story and the emotional aspect that will catch the attention you know for the people who look at it One of the things that you know in uh, moving images is, you know, it's different from you know, a static print um, image. Um, you only get the moment, you know, of impressions of what, and then you ch you would want to, you know, um, you know, see it again or find out. And and a lot of time that is not only just one single image; it's the totality of the, you know, of the sequence to give you that that you know impressions so um, as a title designers you know we deal with a short sequence so it's, you know for you know televisions you know normally 30 seconds 20 seconds you know 45 seconds you know most um, but then for film then we have more time because you know when you go to the theater then you know you you are pretty much you know and you know lock up you know, in the in the theaters, you know, situation that you can you know walk out, you know, you don't want to walk out, and it's really and close until completely dark, and you 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 suck your you know it suck you in, you know, to pay attention to a lot of details. Um, so you know, this is a title sequence that I felt you know very um, you know um, passionate and strongly about this you know title sequence um, is um, is. Um, uh, is this film Oz the Great and Powerful? There's a fly here. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, um, so, um, so the typography is something that I get very excited about. It you know, it, we get a chance to actually exercise, you know, and have freedom to really, really deal with the typography. Um, the each scene, each you know, each con you know content, you know, of each screen for 
you know, each credits are very unique, you know, designed for a very specific, you know, um, um, scenario. And we were looking at, you know, a lot of uh, fine to display types, you know, in, you know, um, you know, like um, 19th century or 18th century old, old font, um, you know, like, um, you know, some of the circuits, you know, posters, you know, graphic posters that, you know, we were, we were looking at in, in reference to. Um, so the idea is to build this um, paper uh, theaters. And um, this is all done in created digitally. There's no um, there's, there's no actual physical, um, you know, artwork that has been built. But as you see, there's a lot of details, you know, on each, you know, frames and configurations. You know, those are just a moment, you know, in the whole entire sequence. You can imagine, you know, when you, when they all come, you know, emotions and the, the, the constantly evolving the layouts, you know, the layout of, you know, of, you know, of, of the, you know, of the artwork and, and they are changing, you know, all the time. It's, it's fascinating. And if there's something that, you know, I, I it, it, you know, is something that I had that passion, you know, when I, you know, graduated, you know, from the design school, then, you know, and, and and totally abandoned, you know, the the my you know graphic design practice, um, then moved into film title design um, and motion graphics. And because I think that you know, if we see something is more like a create something that is more like a time based you know kind of storytelling, then you know we have much more freedoms and more more latitude to create some, you know, to tell the story. Um, so there are 31 different fonts and they all, you know, uh, in reference to all the old, you know, fonts that, you know, we will, you know, you know look at, um, you know, from the, from, you know, from some of the circuits poster or carnival, you know, old carnival, you know, uh, um, billboards and, you know, things like that in Europe. Um, and, and I find that, you know, a lot of European um, letter forms and, you know, and typography in the old days is they are, they has a very, you know, more personality to it. And, you know, and I always wanted to imagine, you know, each, each characters, each font, they, they, do they have the story to tell by itself? Um, you know, you know, and I think that, you know, when when we put all these things together, then we will be able to um, complete you know a story. So here is the you know the opening for the Oz.
for for this particular piece, uh, you know, the way that you know, working with the team, it's not only one person who, who would be able to create all those different, you know, configurations and the letter form design and all this. We have a team, you know, to work on this. I felt like, you know, I was conducting, you know, the orchestra and then this really, you know, it's really, a, um, you know, really joyful, you know, working on, you know, on this, um, you know, project. Um, so, my my interest, um, it, it, uh, um, um, you know, this for the past few years has always been. I wanted to, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to get back to the roots of, you know, what I wanted to do because I've been doing um, commercial work for, you know, the past you know twenty years and you know and I started you know to think about you know maybe because of. You know, when when you're getting older, then you know you want to think about you know what exactly what you wanted to do. So you know, I I I had the opportunities you know to um, you know to um, to put a a very large scale installations a multimedia installation together two years ago at the PS fifty seven, and you know and and you know and I was you know I was given for you know for this idea of utilizing um, containers, you know, in this abandoned, you know, uh, piers. I, I always think fascinating by the, you know, by the containers because my father uh, was a seaman, you know, he never actually make it as a captain of a cargo ship. He, you know, he was the first officer, you know, of the cargo ship, you know, and, you know, and I remember, you know, I always, you know, go, you know, to visit him. And I created this, you know, this image and, you know, for my own show um, of a little boy that I wanted to introduce, you know, um, in, you know, um, in my show. Um, and um, I was working with um, this architect, you know, Jose Maria, you know, in, you know, in, in Brazil that, you know, he, he, you know, he had this idea of hanging 36 containers, you know, inside this 15,000 square feet, um, uh, well, 25,000, not 15,000, 25,000 square feet, you know, uh, warehouse suspended, you know, in, in the air. And, you know, and I wanted to do a configuration that would be able to, you know, create a center tunnel and putting, you know, four projectors, you know, on, you know, and project the image on, you know, on the left side of the of the containers, and then you know, putting four projectors on the, you know, um, right side of the container, and and having the center um, lines of container like a uh, a train, you know, um, you know, you know, kind of a, uh, uh, what do you call that? Um, a train, you know. So you you go to from train you know uh, a, a compartment from train to train, um, so you know, and I wanted to have some kind of a sound interactions, um, and you know I painted you know the you know the containers inside the center uh, um, you know tunnels you know in black and you know wanted to you know encourage you know um, uh, visitor and come to the show. And you know they will start you know writing you know their own you know message and story and things like that. You can imagine you know there's the people that just write all kind of things you know in you know on the wall you know at that time. Um, and uh, there's a lot because you're right by the West Side Highway, so there are a lot of bikers you know bicyclists you know will come and bring their kids and they really love it you know kids love you know to you know draw on the wall and things like that and and you know and there was you know it's a great um, fund um, for families and you know be there even dog loves it you know they you know they're there and I you know I created the second posters you know with all the um, um, all the um, subways, you know, um, signs, you know, that all the trains numbers and letters and created this image that you know, more look like a, um, uh, a crossword puzzles. So, um, and I wanted to encourage in the weekends that there's a, um, um, there was a, um, a, 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 a sound um, Easter egg 
hunt. You know, the parents will take their kids and go and pick the words, you know, from, you know, from the from the image and then go, you know, you know, find the song. You know, um, and then um, you know they will write a story. The parents will, you know, based on the different type of sound, you know, that will write the story. And you know, we have kids that you know we have sound we have sound that you know hidden you know inside the container. Um, we have speakers that you know will installed above you know the, the on the comp on the containers and. And it's a motion sensor that you know once you walk under the you know the the speakers you know it will trigger you know the sound you will hear you know uh, a bottles you know you know breaking sound you know and different type of you know the sound. Um, so you know on top of that you know there is a microphone. There are eight different microphones to control eight different containers images. You could use your, you know, your voice to activate, you know, the um, the images. Um, and I created um, a 15 minutes of a film short that will go around, you know, as a like a train, you know, go around, um, you know, um, as as a circle, you know, um, from one container to another containers. Um, and you could randomly actually fast forward with your voice, or or randomly you could sh you know stop, or you could play some kind of a interactive games, or or shoot you know inter and interactive games like shooting seagulls you know uh, with the laser, um, things like that, and it really attract a lot of people you know in that neighborhood, the community to come, and you know and to me I think that I started to realize and, and you know and one bigger things that I wanted to do, you know, in the future is to bring community, bring people together, you know, through, you know, a, a event, you know, and happenings. So, um, so here is the whole piece of, of, you know, of the installation. Can you turn off the lights, please? Yeah. Thank you. 
so um, that that installation lasts for um, three weeks, you know, at the pier. Um, and um, you know, my son Adrian, um, he was the film student at MIU, helped me to um, and his uh, classmate, and you know, put a crew together, helped me to shoot all the second unit. So you know, it's it's something that I, you know, I you know. I have my own kind of uh, personal, you know, attachments to it. So, um, so that was then, and then to recently, and I had an opportunity to bring something bigger, you know, in Los Angeles. And this time, that I be able to, um, you, know, um, you know, take over and project um, my films on to the city hall of Los Angeles. And um, and I get a chance to bring my little boy, you know, back onto, um, you know, for for this time, and it, you know, the evenings, you know, of you know, that was for a um, um, New Year's Eve um, event, and it brought over, you know, forty five thousand people together, you know, to to see that um, film, so. Um, I'm going to show you this last piece. Um, hope you enjoy it. Well, there is a big New Year's celebration going on in downtown LA, allowing as many as 50,000 people to ring in the New Year. The celebration will include a digital countdown projected onto two sides of City Hall. This is one of the biggest parties in Los Angeles. It's going to be a fun party. Oh, yeah.
That's all. Thank you for watching. Anybody have any questions for either Paul or for Rod Barton? Nothing? Well then, Happy New Year. Anyone that entered the competition, I wish you luck this weekend. And I hope to see you all starting in February at the club. So good night.